you talked about the, the pension fund. Uh, how's the pension fund doing? Uh, we don't have our final numbers for March 31st. That's our key figure because that's the end of the fiscal year. So that's the number that goes into our audited uh, uh, numbers and the calculations when we figure out how much uh, we're going to charge the employers. You know, March was kind of a skittish month, again, largely because of the war in Ukraine and what that did. Uh, so I was a little concerned that March 31st wasn't as good as if we had closed the books on, just, on January 31st, but I don't control that. We're, we're locked into the fiscal year. But as we saw, April, May were even more difficult months. So for the pension fund, uh, I, I think we're going to end up, when we do the final numbers, at or very near our target number, which right now is 5.9, is a long-term uh, goal for investment return. And we keep in mind we come off of last year a record uh, positive return of 33%. So as we always uh, like to remind everyone, one of our strengths in terms of our finances is the fact that our pension fund is well-funded. So that's good not only for the, the public workers and the public retirees for their retirement security, but for the financial standing of our states, why our credit rating has gotten better, well, our pension fund is over 99% funded. So even if this will be a you know, tougher environment in the short run, you know, we're well prepared to weather that. So we were able to cut the contribution rate to our government employers. That's good for taxpayers, good for local budgets. Uh, last year, I don't know that we're going to be able to do that this year. I'm hoping at least we could keep the rates pretty stable, but I'm still wait, waiting to close the books. But definitely, we see, you know, how the markets are more volatile right now. The good news also, though, Tom, is that we don't have all of our money in the stock market. We do have about half of our portfolio there, largely tied to index funds. But to counterbalance that, we still have uh, about 25%, a little less maybe, in alternative investments, real estate, private equity, infrastructure investments, and another quarter, you know, probably a little less right now, in fixed income, which is a very safe investment. Uh, but you don't make a lot of money in fixed income right now because of interest rates, although they're starting to go up. So uh, I'm confident in our asset allocation, how we've set it up. So I don't want anybody to be overly concerned uh, as trustee um, looking out for the pension fund and, and as I said we, we, we go into any challenging time from position of strength and that's good news. Two plus years into the pandemic and you mentioned the state, the city, counties, communities appear to be recovering. Are some of those still facing significant challenges? Yeah. Yeah, the recovery varies from region to region and what's very interesting, well, often when we talk about New York State and the economy, we talk about New York City as the economic engine, right, given the size and, and what goes on there. Um, what's interesting is that the city is lagging the rest of the state now. The recovery actually has been stronger uh, outside of the city because the city was hit so hard uh, and closed down so completely. And, and, and as people know, uh, there, there are many issues uh, that are keeping people from returning to 100 uh, percent work. We, we may not see 100 percent back in the, in the workplace. So when you have some of those office buildings that are, you know, 50% or less occupied now, uh, the office workers aren't going out at lunchtime, spending money and keeping the restaurants going, retail, Broadway's been coming back in entertainment, but that was hit very hard. So when we look at New York State generally, we're about now, of the jobs that we lost during the depths of, of the COVID shutdown, we recovered about 76% of those jobs. So not a bad number, but compared to national, national figure is more like 95, 96%. So as a state, we're lagging in the recovery compared to the nation, but the reason for that is that the city is, is, is lagging in the rest of the state. So the city's recovery is now like in the mid-60s, you know, below 70%. So one of the big issues for all of us is for New York City to, you know, to, uh, to come back. And they're, they're dealing with a, a whole range of issues down there, you know, not just the economic, but, you know, crime has been an issue, quality of life issues that, that, that impact in terms of people's desire to come to the city. Foreign travel is still way off, you know, again, related to COVID, you know, domestic travel has, has come back and day trippers and so on. But, but generally speaking, uh, much more positive uh, than negative. You know, we see that in the unemployment numbers, even in the city, continuing to improve. So I, I think it's fair to say the numbers are pointed in the right direction. It's just been a slow recovery, particularly in the city, than, than we'd like to see. But as we head into the summer season, I think that's going to be a key indicator as to where we're at. Certainly for this part of the state, tourism is such a big piece of the picture yeah. with the economy. And we're all hoping for a really good tourism season. The same will be true for the city. In the city, with workers not going back to the office, MTA ridership is off, which of course is a big concern. Big issue. Here in the North Country, the transportation yeah. cluster that builds the buses and subway cars. Yeah. Uh, concerns about 
getting, a, the, will the MTA have financial issues yeah. because of the ridership being off so dramatically they, for two they, years? They do, I mean a big part of the MTA's revenue is, is what comes in at the fare box. But the good news, at least in the short term, is you've seen a massive infusion of federal dollars to prop up the MTA. Again, that's good in the short run. In the longer term, I mean, the MTA's had a lot of issues in terms of how they manage their finances, and we've been critical of some of that. And they've made some not so good choices on how they've uh, managed their finances in the past, and we're paying some of the consequences for that now. Uh, and we do need to do a better job of identifying how we're gonna pay for the capital plan. And the MTA has a history of not uh, fulfilling their schedule in terms of the capital plan. So they, they're on to a new capital plan and they haven't finished their old capital plan. So that, you know, there's new leadership there at the MTA and, and, uh, and hopefully they're gonna be able to restart uh, some of what um, was put by the wayside because of COVID. But the big game changer for the MTA really has been uh, the, the, the big help from Washington as far as public transit. It's helped upstate transit, public transit as well. But the MTA, and you point out the connection that sometimes people downstate don't realize to the upstate economy of, 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 of the MTA. Uh, and and I, I do have to say, uh, having Chuck Schumer as our majority leader has been very helpful because he has been very focused on ensuring that when the federal money comes out that uh, for public transit that New York gets its share and we get a big chunk of that federal public transit money and much of that goes to the MTA. So I would say in the short run, Tom, um, we're surviving and managing, uh, but we need to do a better job of making sure the money's there longer term for the capital expenditures. And a big part, you're absolutely right, we've got to get people back to wanting to use the trains. That gets back to some of those other issues that are concerning people in the city. You know, putting aside whether or not your workplace is going, you know, permanently to be part remote, there's still a lot of concern about people riding the trains, riding the subways because of some of the incidents that, that people have been reading about. Right.